Hey folks, Marsico X here. And you might be wondering what this video is about, but in short, I wrapped up on voicing an audiobook. A few months ago, I was approached to record this audiobook, and I've always wanted to do them, but I never realized how much work goes into them. And, uh, whew, this was a journey, because this book, it's a biggie. If you like to hear my voice for what if stories, I think you're gonna like this one, because this story, it's very Dragon Ball, especially when you get to chapter five. But let me give you the premise about this. The book is called The Marhamyam of Tumma, and already there are gonna be loads of tricky pronunciations, but I nailed it. But speaking of the premise, it's a boy who is cursed by a sage to be exiled from his home for 12 years. And so he goes on a journey, but along the way, he slowly becomes entangled in an ancient conflict between gods and demons. And in some ways, it isn't too different from the original Dragon Ball, but it does veer into more serious territory as it progresses. And believe me, there were a lot of twists that I didn't expect when I was actually recording this. You don't have to wait for this. You can actually get it right now on Gumroad and Audible. I'll leave the links to it in the description. And it works for the US and the UK. I can actually give you a sample right now because you might be wondering why this video is so long. But yeah, strap yourselves in folks, and I shall be giving you the introduction and chapter one of this magnificent tale. I'll leave you to it, and I hope you enjoy. Maharnyam of Tumma, Book One of Revealing Contentions. Written by Tumma. Narrated by Lawrence Simpson. Introduction. Salutations. A long time has passed since I began deciphering this work. The plagues that have assailed us day and night, the unease of the citizens and the aristocracy, and the mobilizing of the forces across the borders of the nations. I can only see all these in the coming days to bring about great misery and tragedy for us. War is coming to Armanha, my friends, and there is little that can be done to prevent it. The great sages had already foretold of these coming events long past, and yet, as foolish as we were, we did not hearken to them, taking only what we saw as doable and discarding the rest. Many times did they tell us that our complacence to this corrupted system that we have held to for so long would indeed bring about great doom, and when that doom occurred, neither renewal nor restoration should happen for a long time thereafter and in that lapse we should only sink deeper into the darkness of our follies, perhaps even perishing as a result. Yet it does not mean that we cannot now better ourselves at this moment, and see to things that are greater than even us. The gods may still have abandoned us, we may hear no more from the ancestors, the spirits may have left the earth, and yet through all of this do we still supplicate to them, wishing for their return, always knowing that the light remains, ever abiding within all the hearts of the Marhan. I tell you now, when the nations of the five continents, when the principalities of the many islands, and when the rogue entities of the world come to a head, their destruction shall be assured. And should we thereupon fall from that moment in likeness, then we should accept it with our heads held high, and in due grace, as our forefathers once had. I will not give you hope for life, for I am not confident we should survive. Yet, even in these most perilous of times, I hope this cherished history that I have now deciphered in full, whose many contents that were said to be lost to time, but that are now recovered and brought back to the surface, now presented for the first time to the public, will give you the desire to go higher than this world, and seek that which is beyond all else our true home, our true abode. And with this said, I say now with pride and with conviction what we have said before and what we continue to say, that one and all shall manifest in you. And with that, I shall continue my work. Should the forces of the world permit, I hope that the grand saga that exceeds even this one, that even those great sages of old cherish so greatly, will see the light of day. My sincere gratitude to you, unknown translator, unknown year in the era of annihilation. Prologue A grand sacrifice was to take place in the Forest of Transients. Sixty thousand sages had travelled far 
to take part in this auspicious event, occurring once every 12 years. And chief among them was Samita, foremost of the Arhaman, disciple to the great sage Vardruha, and the greatest of bards that had lived in that time. Now in that forest were abounded fruits, vegetation, and animals of all kinds, and magnificent lakes and ponds that were alike to ones that could be sought in the heavens, that noble man sat upon a circular stone platform, overlooking the great sacrificial altar, where about slowly sat all the participants of that event. There he meditated and waited upon those eager to hear him talk and sing. When all the sages had been seated and had begun to offer oblations into the fire, calling to the divine with various hymns, a sage by the name of Shunaya sat beside Samita and said, O blessed devotee of the highest being, you who have arrived to officiate alongside us this grand sacrifice, we come seeking your narration of the greatest of the Marhan that walked this world in the days of yore a man greater than any who had come before, dispensing to us the universal wisdom that had been lost for many an age. Will you recite the Parvanam of this great individual, O one who is of the sun? The recitation stopped, and all became quiet. Samita sat silent a while, and then opened his eyes. He smiled before the attendees, and to the sage that sat beside him, and then bowing with folded hands, he said, Indeed. I shall do as you request, O son of Shuna. But the tale you ask me to speak, which I heard wholly dispensed by my teacher, is a long one, toilsome to recite, and will take much time to speak of it all. Yet it seems the sun himself, who shines from above, has halted in his motion, seeming eager to hear of my words concerning it. O oh, great thrice-born sages who have gathered here, O oh, Shunaya of great ascetic merits, O demons who dwell below the earth, suffering from the pangs of hunger, and O gods who reign above the sky, remaining ever quiet to the doings of the Mahan, where shall I begin this most glorious tale? The sages remained silent. The ground then shook, and soon after, silenced. And upon its end, the sages shifted their gazes toward the sky, seeming to wait upon another to speak for them. And as this thought passed in the air, the light shafts cut through the clouds, beaming on both the altar and the two sages that sat beside one another. Blanketed in gold and warmth, Shunaya said, Both the demons and the rest of the gods seem eager to hear as well, even though they still remain silent. We ask that you recite this magnificent tale from its beginning, from the birth of this individual, to his journey with his many companions, and culminating at the resolution of that era recite all of which we so dearly desire to hear, so that this wonderful saga may be passed to generations to come. Samita was exceedingly glad, and said, Be it so, O great sages. May those that hear this tale shine like the resplendent Samistraha, blaze like the immortal Sayagnava, blessed in all their totality. They all then smiled, with a deep breath, chanted, um. Chapter 1 A Boy and His Teacher In the land of Armanha, resident to the sphere of the Middle Realm, and deep within the heart of the Hematite Mountains, dwelt a young couple in a forest of Siconium trees. The forest lay at the outskirts of a village called Paraftara, resting near the banks of a river a quaint little place of cylindrical stone and wooden houses arrayed in a spiral fashion, facing the southeast, with no more than a few hundred residing. The trees towered over the surface, spiraling towards the heavens, with large boughs that would spread for miles and hold themselves aloft with descending branches that dug deep into the soil. It was in here that they spent much of their day tending to various tasks, such as chopping wood, harvesting crops, and selling leftover produce. But whenever the sun set upon the northwestern face of the earth, they would head with food in hand to the village, and in glee and mirth, eat and drink to their heart's content, relating stories of heroes and adventures throughout the night. Like this were their days ever blissful. 
One day, a sage came by seeking shelter from the rain. He had journeyed a long way and would have to travel farther to arrive at his destination. He entered their home when no one was around, for in those days, persons of great repute, be they a simple peasant or the highest king, but especially sages, could seek shelter wherever they sought without permission from the owner. There he sat on the floor, waiting and meditating. When time had passed, the couple returned with collected wood and food, and they saw the sage seated upon the floor. Now, having not seen a sage in all their lives, they mistook his unseemly and unkempt appearance to be that of a madman's and feared for their lives. They silently gathered together pots, pans, and other utensils, and, with short notice, they lifted the sage by the arms and smacked his head silly, chasing him away from their place. And when he was outside, under the heavy rain, he faced them, brimming with anger, as nine bolts of lightning struck the surface around him, setting alight the grass. Then the couple realized what he was, but it was too late, as he held his left index finger pointed to the heavens and cursed them, saying, you foolish lot, do you treat all your guests alike? In seven months' time, a child you shall have, and when that child has reached the end of his boyhood, he shall be separated from his home for twelve years hence, one year for every smack you have dealt me. My words shall hold and will not be overturned. Failure to abide by this will lead to all your deaths. That is the truth. Mortified by his words, the couple fell at his feet, begging for forgiveness to overturn the curse. While still fired with wrath, he began to slowly reflect, and it was soon after that it altogether softened, and realizing what it was he had uttered, he became wholly saddened. I apologize, but what I have said is true. My words have power and that power cannot be revoked. Fear not, however, or your child shall not venture alone. When the time comes, I will return to train him for the path that awaits him. Along that path, he shall meet many companions who will aid him on his journey. Never shall he feel loneliness, and never shall his adventures fail to delight. This I swear. The couple, relieved, brought the sage back to their home, and tended to the sores that afflicted his head. The sage put his hand upon the lady's belly and said, A child grows there inside you. This is the child that I spoke of. The couple was ecstatic over his words, but also disheartened by the plight their child would have to face. When morning had come, the sage said to the couple, When the child reaches six years of age, I shall make him my disciple and train him in the elements and the precepts of religion. The couple bowed to the sage, clasping his feet and putting their lips to them. The sage bent down, gently caressed their heads, and lifted them before setting back on his journey. When seven months had passed, just as the sage had said, the child was born, possessed of smooth olive skin, deep green eyes, and rich black hair. The mother named him Tumma and the father held the child, shouting the boy's name aloud for the whole village to hear. All pronounced blessings upon him as the child seemed to laugh. He grew to be a strong child, boisterous and exceedingly mischievous. Nothing seemed to put fear into him, and he often led the children on many excursions into the forest, far past where his home lay. Many times they journeyed deep in, when many of the boughs entangled themselves above like a spider web and blocked out the light of the sun. The others all too quickly became scared and rushed back. Tumma always followed them behind, but his adventurous spirit never gave in, and he attempted, with or without them, to journey as far as he could. The forest, the plains, the river, and even the mountains afar, he tried to scout as much as he could, and all the while, his parents could not help but become worried, and as a precaution, often kept him stuck at their home or in the village 
under the supervision of neighbors. With all his eccentricity, never once did he disobey his parents. But that did not mean he never sought other avenues to satiate his desire for adventure. One day, early in the morning, he ventured into the depths of the Siconian forest. Many vines and dangling branches obstructed his path, but with a sickle that he took clandestinely from his house, he cut them all down with ease. The light dimmed from the canopy, and things all of a sudden became dark. Now, while he was indeed a brave fellow, he was not so much accustomed to handling things without his sight, and began to cower in fear. However, it did not stop his advance deeper through, and with the faint traces of light, he marched on. Soon, he heard voices from the trees, something akin to hisses and screeches, but not by any person. No. Before he realized it, there was a swarm of monkeys and apes and vultures and crows and all manner of other beasts that followed him on his trail, and they kept guarded watch and seemed even at certain points, to intimidate. Tuma, within the six years he had lived to this point, had never before come across such vicious animals, and he began to grow afraid. The trail began to narrow, and the calls and shouts of the animals resounded high and wide, and he tripped and stumbled on an overgrown root and tumbled down a hill, falling to the base where he saw the light creeping through. There were ruins in front of him, ancient ones, hewn from cut granite and stone, and lined with inscriptions in Ahustrata. It was then that a piercing screech paralyzed him and signaled to the predators to prowl about. From out of the ruins emerged a massive figure, a great ape, looking to be a gorilla, but the fur of which was lined red with golden accents. It beat its chest and roared and charged to Tumma and the boy, regaining control of his senses, leapt from his spot and tried to flee. But it was no use. His legs would not move. And just as the towering gorilla was to impact him, lo! A great bolt of lightning struck the ground. It was then thrust back, crushing into the ruins with a tremendous gust of wind. The pillars collapsed on it, and the dust filled the area. And soon after, it soared high, far past the canopy, shooting to some place far off. Its screeches and wails resounded loud through the forest until it vanished without a trace, and the animals suddenly cowered, all coming forward and prostrating. Tumma, on realizing, saw that there was a man who stood before him, dressed in saffron garments, his grey hair braided and wrapped like a conical pyramid, with a thick and long beard descending from his face. He spoke to the animals with a gentle voice and bore himself with humility, yet the animals could not help but see this man as greater than them. They all nodded their heads, and when the man gave them leave, they scurried away. Tuma, overjoyed, said, How did you do that, mister? The man turned to Tuma and held his finger up, saying, Eh? Yeah. The boy looked at him with confusion, and the man asked, Child, do you know who I am? Tumar took a closer look, and then recalling what his parents had told him many times before, his eyes widened. Pointing to him, he exclaimed, You must be the silly sage who can shoot lightning! At once, the sage put his fist to Tumar's head, sighing and saying, oh, What a child you have become! To which the boy laughed. The two of them ventured out of the forest, and all the villagers came running to them, and among the throng was Tumma's mother, who ran toward him, before stopping in her tracks. She looked to the sage, and as soon as she realized who he was, she prostrated, and, holding his feet and putting her head to them, said, You have returned, great sage, my gratitude to you for saving my son. Think nothing of it, he said with a smile. It is the least I could do after my actions. But I must know, did you happen to see a large gorilla flying in this direction? She immediately got up and said, Yes, yes, did it come from the forest? He nodded and said, Take me to it. Tumma, alongside his mother, the sage, and the other villagers, 
went to the outskirts of the village, where the gorilla had smashed into the ground. Its head seemed thoroughly stuck in the earth, and it surprised them that the ground about the beast had not cracked or even ejected upon impact. The sage approached and grabbed it by the neck, and pulling it out, he slapped its face left and right many times. You are the guardian of that forest, are you not? asked the sage. The gorilla, on waking and seeing who it was standing before it, nodded as it quivered in fright. The sage had it stand on its legs and fists and said to it, Do be careful of who it is you attack. The boy did not mean to enter your territory without permission. He, along with the other villagers, did not know you to be abiding in that place and watching. But now they know, and no more shall they cross you. And I would ask that you lend them your protection instead of your wrath, should a time come when they need it. The gorilla prostrated and furiously nodded its head, then ran past the villagers, hurtled through the centre of the village back into the forest, and was for a time not seen again. Tummar, at this point, tiptoed away, being careful not to alert them, and then he hit something, and looked up, and saw it was his mother, and she, furious, shouted, No more shall you enter the forest past our home! He leapt back in fright, but, being obedient to his parents, he silently assented, with his head hung low. Yet she thereafter sighed and said, You may go. However, if it is with the sage, he has much to teach you. And he lifted his head up with a great smile and looked to the sage, who gave him a stern look. He gulped. The harsh tutelage that his parents spoke of was soon to follow. The sage thereon trained Tumma, and the boy grew ever more adept in the art of honing the elements, often by way of meditating and directing his focus to their control. Yet less than adequate was he in understanding the precepts of religion. Whenever days involving the recitation of hymns or the study of religion came, he always attempted to evade his teacher by sitting next to the fiyukti, that is the sacrificial altar, residing in the centre of the village. It consisted of a large metal bowl, seated upon a circular stepped structure, with flames rising high from the burning oil. Using his newly acquired powers, he excited the flames into a blaze to the fright of all the villagers. Then in haste, he ran as the villagers gave chase in an attempt to discipline him. But never could they catch him, and the sage always laughed whenever he beheld that spectacle. Some days he sparred with Tumma, either with fists or at other times with the elements. In almost all cases, the sage sent the boy soaring and crashing through trees and boulders, and even pummeled him into the earth. At other times, he had him perform various exercises and trials that allowed him to fortify his body. One such exercise had him sit over a fire pit for an extended period of time, and often unable to bear the heat, he danced atop it, with the sage smacking him off and telling him to try again. Some exercises had him stay in a bed of a lake or a pond for some hours, holding his breath, while yet others had him balancing on the tips of the highest trees on a single toe, with birds flocking to him and occasionally making him fall off but even more consisted of him carrying huge boulders or rocks or even dense weights on his back to run with around the village, much to the horror of his parents and the amazement of the villagers. And even when the sage was not present or left to somewhere far off for a short time, if Tumma slacked in his training, he would know and the boy would not be let off easy. One might think such practices were harsh and not in the least fit for a training regimen, much less for that of a child, but the boy's body indeed fortified, and soon after he became the strongest member in the village to the surprise of everyone, and almost to the shame of all the men. On other days they scouted the plains far from the village along the river, and the sage told Tummar many things concerning the outside world and the things it held, and while this greatly interested the boy, he always looked to the mountains standing far off 
the black crags towering high with their red hues never ceased to amaze him. But he also felt them to be sinister, for they were much like a cage, seeming to wish to keep him locked behind, and they never gave him a chance to seek more than the normal life he led, barring his training with the sage, of course. Whenever it was he gazed upon those mountains, he felt a deep desire and yearning to see what lay beyond, to seek a purpose that far surpassed that of a regular village life, and that wish of his inflamed the desire of adventure all the more. Many expected that he would become a Zuryasha, like his teacher, but the sage had no desire to train him in the precepts and the powers beyond what the boy desired. And Tumbar, indeed, did not much want to become a sage, having resolved to become a traveller. Though many did not take him seriously, and saw his venturing into the world as only temporary. For now, however, much of it remained wishful thinking. His teacher, and much less his parents, would not allow him to leave the confines of the valley. At least not yet. In fact, his parents sought a way for him to stay close, but the sage always reprimanded them when they brought up the issue, telling them to never test the power of the curse, and they, as a matter of course, always relented, never trying to doubt or cross the sage while in his presence, and ever keeping their child's safety in mind. It was indeed best that the boy stayed as far away as possible, out of the reach of influence of the villagers. None could truly say what the nature of the curse was with specificity. Yet he would not have to wait long. The six years left would pass quicker than he would think. There came a time while camping in the forest that Tummar began to have some doubts. He found it quite strange that only he was given the benefit of leaving, while the others could not. And so he asked the sage, I see none of the other boys and girls being taught as I am. What makes me so special, teacher? I know I'm to travel at some point, but why not the others? Can't they come as well? The sage looked to him with sadness, and understanding it was best for him to know now rather than later. He said, Out of the foolishness of anger did I curse you and your parents. When your boyhood ends and your next stage of life begins, you must set out from this village. You should not return until twelve years have passed, thus marking you as an adult. If you return before the allotted time has expired, both you and your parents shall perish. This was what I pronounced, and though most unfortunate, it shall be held to be true until its due has been paid. To this effect, I prepare you for the dangers of the outside world. As for the other children, I do not very much think that they would be all that willing to leave, and not least because of their parents and your antics, and I myself shall not train them. One thing you have that they lack is some level of discipline when it comes to harsh exercises, without which you would have not progressed as far as you have now. It is not a very wise idea to teach those in such things when they are not ready, and aside from you, there are few born with the ability to use the powers, as you no doubt know with the case of the priests and the priestesses. But given your circumstances, I saw it fit that, regardless of attunement, I should at the very least teach you how to use the elements, as well as teach you the precepts, so that it may help you on your journey, and perhaps seek higher goals. And glad am I that at least in one of those you have been diligent enough. And the boy, embarrassed, laughed, before saying, Well, it's sad that I'll have to travel without them, but I can say this. It really doesn't seem much of a curse. In fact, it seems more of a blessing. It gives me reason to see all that the world has to hold beyond the reaches of those mountains. I doubt my parents would let me travel for the sake of joy. I myself wish to become more than just a regular villager, and I know the outside world can show me all the things that life has to offer. <laughs> of course you would see it like that, and perhaps you may yourself become great but know the curse is less for you and more for your parents. They will be the true sufferers behind this, for what parents would ever desire to let go of their child? Yet I sense this journey you shall undertake has more concerning it than you or I currently know. 
there is more evil afoot in other spheres of the world, and I fear what shall happen to Ardamanha when the time it shall strike comes. It would seem even the gods above are beginning to grow weary, and have even dispatched their own to the midworld to seek aid. Oh? You talked with the gods? What's going to happen? asked Tummar with excitement. Foolish child, this is nothing to be eager for, he said. Then he sighed. I shall refrain to speak more of such things, knowing you are one to always seek trouble. And Tummar pouted, having taken great offence to that. He was a troublemaker, but never felt he was that much of one. But no matter, I guess. We shall see where the roads lead you. And yes, at times I do commune with them, but not for long and not very often. The last I spoke with them was many years ago, long before you were even born. Time works differently up there, as you know. They have much business to take care of, as do you. So, enough questions. Now it is time we trained again. And Tuma, having a newfound resolve, engaged ever more dutifully under the tutelage of his teacher. As time passed, he gained an unexpected new ability of talking to animals, which was unusual to many, including his teacher, for he had never taught him how to do so. But the villagers quickly took a liking to the strange ability. Many of his adventurous escapades by that point had come to a close, for he was now chained to helping the villagers with translating the words of the farm animals whenever he was not training. And though the animals delighted in his presence, this proved uneventful and quite boring for him, as many of these animals could barely hold a conversation. Yet, all the while, he could still cause mischief with small critters and rodents, giving them instructions which, like little servants, they obediently followed. It would not be long, however, before he mastered the principles his teacher bestowed upon him. The wind swayed through the trees, and the leaves rustled in silence. The air was slightly humid, but pleasant, and the sun came peeking through the canopy, its shining rays bathing all in a light gold, and the grass below was moist with early morning dew, soft to the touch for their bare feet. In the clearing of the forest, the sage and his pupil stood poised for battle. He sought to test Tummar one last time before leaving, and did not expect himself to be bested, but all the same, when this fight was over, he knew he would not be seeing Tummar for some time. Six years had already passed, and with the boy now reaching twelve, the time came for his departure. Yet Tumma was excited to test his mettle one last time against the sage who had put him through such harsh and strenuous training that it would surely have made a layman keel over. And while he did not much like any of it, even now, he was glad for just that moment to have the sage as his teacher. Silence hung in the air and all the animals came to spectate, and stood far back in the thickets, or high above in the trees. The gorilla had also come, sitting a distance away. It was the referee for this match, as odd as that was, but it had been set up nonetheless for that role by the sage himself. It looked to both of them, who waited for its signal. Seeing that all was good, and the battle ready to commence, it held its arm up, and with a great roar, it flung its arm down into the ground, cracking the surface. The animals hollered, and the two combatants flew toward one another. Block for block, blow for blow, their attacks were matched and struck in perfect sync. The air was blasted between the strikes, making the rocks and the trees shudder. The impact and force of the strikes was so great that it made even their skin flap with the whiplash. And then suddenly, the sage opening his hand caught the flying fist. Tummar was reeled in and sent flying toward the canopy. His teacher shifted his gaze above with his left arm held high, and from the open palm a great blaze arose and ignited the air. It flew in a stream, and the boy quickly encased himself in earth around which the flames spread but could not penetrate it. But the weight of the element was great and Tummar plummeted like a boulder toward his teacher, who with a high sweep of his leg struck the encasing crust and shattered it. But the leg did not let up in its motion, 
for the sage twisted himself, and arcing his leg down, he thrust Tumar into the ground, forcing the dirt and the soil high. When the dust cleared, the boy was nowhere to be seen, though the sage was unfazed and stood still. The shrubs and trees were silent, yet the air moved about differently from where he was, and following his ears toward the source, he shifted his head to the side, where his eyes followed past the boy's fist, and with his speed heightened, the sage caught a hold of Tumma's back and propelled him fast behind, sending him flying like a missile. The sage's defences were nigh impenetrable, and the boy himself knew this, but still he persevered, hoping luck was on his side. With the adrenaline now rushing through him with greater might, he landed on a trunk and sent himself flying back. He waxed his powers. The air, combined with fire, created a blaze, and the blaze, doused in water, steamed, and the earth was enveloped in the steaming blaze, turning molten. And with this last muster of strength and show of force, he projected his powers toward the sage in a fierce stream of elemental might. The sage spread his legs, and with his palms set forth, he held against the onslaught. The elements forced him back, and his hands became seared and cut, yet his face remained calm. With just a light push of his hands, the elements all at once dispelled, and the exhaust and fumes of that potent display effused the air. Yet not a moment sooner, Tumma was now in front of him, his hand seared and his body steaming, but now with only a foot distance between. He could at that moment have incapacitated Tumma had he rushed him down with a pummel of blows, as he had done many times before. But he refrained. He saw something behind Tumma, a light, as it were, and he smiled upon seeing that. Now, he wished to give his student just one moment of victory, and leaving himself open, he took the boy's fist straight into his face. He soared back through the column of great trees, felling at least thirty of them before at last impacting a boulder where the dirt and debris were ejected high. The great trees fell down, crushing into their kin on either side, and sending the animals flying in fear. The sound of their fall reverberated loud, startling all who could hear it, beyond even the village itself. Tumma skidded across the ground and landed not far from the base of the first stump, and thereafter silence held. The gorilla was wide-eyed and unable to move, as its hair stood on end, and suddenly the sage and his pupil laughed loudly, and the gorilla, breaking from his position, roared alike in delight. All the animals came racing back and cheered, holding both the boy and the sage. Tumma for the first time, had defeated his teacher. The early morning passed, and the sun stood a bit higher. Tumma was packed and ready now, and he walked through the village, taking in as much of it as he could before his departure. The villagers, who followed behind alongside his parents, his siblings and his friends, all sobbed and cried. For all the mischief and trouble he caused, he also endeared all who came to know him. He wore a loose set of maroon pants known as forlia that curled over his legs, held firm by his waist strap and a clasp at each of his ankles, together with an ornamented skirt that draped down the back of his legs and receded in the front, tucked and held by his pants, and a green shirt loosely held by three buttons. He approached the cows, pigs and sheep, bowing to them, and said, Farewell, Ditri, Yitri. Medra, Pedra, Hadru, and Fadru, to which they mooed, oinked, and barred in return. He petted the stray dogs and cats, to which they barked and meowed, seeming sad over his departure. To the Fiukti he then approached, and, with folded hands, prayed to the gods. The priests and priestesses, covered from head to toe in thick white robes and donning wooden masks, pronounced blessings upon him and offered him oblations to cast into the flames, which he gladly did. And at last, he approached and bent towards the sage, his teacher, clasping his feet and kissing them. And as he did so, he sang the ode to the Grufo. When he had finished, 
the sage rose him up and kissed him on his head, wishing him well. Congratulations for having bested me. We shall see each other at some point. Tumma, the sage said with a smile. You have listened all your life to me, and though at times you made mistakes, ever did your amends follow. So now, giving you freedom to go where you will, I ask, where do you wish to go? Tumma thought for a bit, having completely forgotten to plan where he was going. After some time, he said, How about south? I heard from some traders that there's a great forest there, and some funny-looking people. The sage was surprised, and then laughed, and said, Go there, if you please. You shall come upon what is known as the Cedar Forest, and I shall have an escort ready there to take you to a place you should very much like. He should bring you to an acquaintance of mine and I shall have him train you for a trial that awaits. If my suspicions are right, then there is a much greater importance your journey holds than I first thought. But even if it does not, you should at least have helped out, and perhaps made a friend, of which I am sure you will make plenty. In any case, I look forward to seeing how much you will have grown in the time that will have passed. Tuma nodded in delight, but internally wished he would not have to see his teacher for a long while. While joyous over having won the battle, the prospect of yet another trial was not all that pleasant to him, and it seemed to him at the moment the sage would have given him one regardless of where he went. The gruelling training and rigorous instruction of his teacher was something he did not desire to undergo again. Knowing what his teacher was predisposed toward, such a thing seemed more than likely were they to meet again. Tumma considered that he should have found it almost a blessing that his teacher could not travel with him. It seemed there were other matters he had to attend to in some secret location, no doubt related to meeting other sages, which his teacher often did do in the small intervals where he was gone from the village. He did not care much to know, but he did find his leaving him, especially now of all times, a little bit suspicious, and he felt slightly conflicted, sad even, that after all this time, the sage had been with him. They would now be parting ways for a long period. But as for the matter of the importance of his journey, well, given how vague his teacher was concerning such matters, he could make little of what that meant. He often wondered what evil should actually come, and how the gods might have been involved since their abandonment, but hoped all the while that it should excite rather than hinder his travels. Now, in front of the entrance, where Tumma took one last look at the small wooden and stone houses of the Yukti and all his friends, his parents cried and embraced him, saying, Our child, be safe in your travels. Make sure to not come back until twelve years have passed. Promise us this. And Tumma, with his childish smile, said, I've always done as you've asked, and this shan't be different. Have no fear, father and mother. I'll return when the curse has passed with mirth and glee, as I've always been. Then he faced his brothers, sisters, and the rest of the villagers, with a large and thick cloth sack in hand, and said, Farewell, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandfathers, grandmothers, teachers, friends, and other associates. May I receive your blessings before departing. And the villagers laughed at his words, dumping an excess of items into the sack, some useful, while others useless yet Tumma accepted them all with pride and joy as he tossed the sack over his back. His siblings embraced him and cried for his departure, but he assured them that he would return. His parents put a garland around his neck and he embraced them one last time. He then turned to set out on his journey and at that moment a powerful gust came. It blew the petals and leaves off of the garland, nearby flowers and trees scattering them in the air. They danced a flight, descending around and upon him, as if the gods were showering him in delight. And to this did all the villagers intone. Tse shakrito yamarharma. That one and all shall manifest in you, child. And the child, who stood just four and a half feet, took those first steps into the vast expanse of the world, breathing in the air that marked the start of his adventure.